A silent revolution is changing the UK's public services. In councils and police forces, workers are seeing the future, literally. What we've looked at is all the children who've been sexually exploited in the city. They are making decisions using computer models, sold on the promise that they can detect problems before they happen. The more I learn about how much data and how these systems are being used, I am shocked daily. It sounds like science fiction, but unseen and largely unregulated, these predictive algorithms are changing lives. You can't go on a, what the computer says, can you? It's got to be human decision. And raising profound questions about who or what is actually in charge. As soon as Aisha was born and her birth was registered, she became data. To understand predictive algorithms, you need to start looking at the world in this way, seeing everyone and everything as an entry on a spreadsheet. Aisha's mum, Mona, gets it. As a 14-year-old, she fled the civil war in Somalia and waited years to see if her plight met the UK's asylum requirements. Now, age 32, she's being measured again as a single mum relying heavily on council support. Like, what kind of benefits do you get then? Um, I get um, uh, an employment support allowance. I used to work, but due to my uh, health problems, I, I cannot work at the moment. I've been now um, on employment support allowance for five years. Okay. Oh, right. uh, because my, yes, that these are my medication, yes, these are yeah. my medication, my daily medication. We met Mona at a food bank in the north of Bristol. We are struggling, we're on low, low income, that's why I, I get help from my health visitor. She referred me to the food bank and they gave me vouchers. Yeah, that helps, that keeps us going for a couple of weeks. In one of Bristol's biggest police stations, we find the destination of Mona and Aisha's data. The Bristol Integrated Analytics Hub, run by Gary Davies, takes in records of benefits, school attendance, crime, homelessness, teenage pregnancy, and even mental health from 54,000 local These families to predict which children will suffer domestic violence, be sexually exploited or go missing. What we do is we have a look at all the children we already know go missing multiple times and we learn uh, what their characteristics look like so that we get a really detailed understanding of their profile. And then what the uh, system does is it will look at children who start to go missing and then say whether they are similar in profile to those children that went missing multiple times. Gary shows me the record for one teenager flagged for early intervention. Oh, missing person risk, 75 out of 100? Yes, that's right. 82 out of 100 for child sex exploitation. That's right, yeah. Um, it will give us a scoring with a kind of banding of a, like a high, medium or low. And also it will give us information about why that profile is saying that. What it isn't doing is it isn't saying computer says yes or no. What it's saying although, is... Although actually it, <laughs> it does say yes or no up there. Yeah, it's what it's saying is yes, there's a risk. But what it's not yeah. saying is that that's not making decisions about you yeah. or your life. No one thinks Aisha's in danger. But all the same, her welfare is being policed by an algorithm. And under the current law, no one had to ask Mona's permission. Jen Person is on a mission. She wants the world to wake up to the dangers of data. I was a, a mum with three young children who just started primary school and knew very little about how information about them was being collected, never thought about it. And then a friend on the school run said to me, have you seen how the government's going to collect um, or your GP records, your medical records, and send them to a national database. And I thought that's wrong. Jen doesn't let smart toys spy on her children. She wouldn't even let us film their pictures. Her fear is that the unique individuality of a child is being sacrificed for the sake of efficiency. We know local authorities have already had 40% cuts to, to their budgets. And technology is being used as a replacement to try and patch up a system which is missing out on people, is missing out on people power. And we're trying to use software to solve these social issues, which it doesn't have the power to do. I tell her what Gary told me, that it's the human social worker who makes the decision. People have a tendency to trust the computer. And 
whilst it's advertised as being able to help you make a decision, often in reality it replaces your human decision and you, you have that sort of faith in the computer that it, it's always going to be right. Predictive algorithms sound like something out of Minority Report, but you've probably used one in the last 24 hours. The Amazon recommendation engine predicts what you'll want to buy. The Facebook suggested friends feature predicts who you'll know. Google autocomplete, YouTube's recommended videos. None of these systems tell you what to do, but they definitely give you a nudge. And crucially, they frame your sense of what's available. They take the past and say, the future will look like this. Working with researchers at Cardiff University, we've compiled the most comprehensive map of predictive algorithms in the UK. It wasn't easy. There is almost no oversight of this new field. We found 53 local authorities predicting everything from bin collections to benefit sanctions. But the most enthusiastic pioneers were these 14 police forces. Outside gallery. Gallery nightclub. Two police officers copy that. We're making our way there now. It's Saturday night in Maidstone in Kent. And PCs Leanne Stark and John Findlay are responding to an incident. Spat his dummy out a few times because he's been asked to leave. Him and his brother are found in the same cubicle. He's then decided to boot the barriers and dent them. And he won't do nothing. And they started getting aggressive towards me, getting in his face. Charlie's come all the way from Essex for this big annual night out. Now, he's about to become a police data point. Part of an algorithm designed to save time and money for Kent's stretched police force. Right, you're under arrest, drunk and still leading. I stand the thing at my home in defence. If you do not mention one question, something later on. Call anything you do, say maybe giving an evidence. Is anything you don't understand about that? Don't mess about it. Come on, get him in the car. Where you going, Mike? Just drink all Charlie. Charlie, you're going in, mate. There's been a stabbing around the corner. Um, person's not currently breathing. Uh, open chest wounds that everyone's just trying to run out to there now. Um, so we'll jump out and let Will go with the van and put this gentleman in his custody while everyone else goes. Come on, jump out. There's so, honestly, there's so much more important stuff I need to deal with right now. Just work with us. Because you just wouldn't go. The problem for Kent Police is the days of work it takes to follow up cases like Charlie's. So now, they ask an algorithm called EBIT whether their investigation will be successful. It's used for a third of all crime in Kent. EBIT helps identify so what inquiries need to be made, witnesses, CCTV, and it helps us build a picture of where we're going to move forward with the investigation. Two hours later, and the stabbing has become a murder investigation. Looking at this, it's obvious why the police need time-saving algorithms. But to a victim, it's not clear why their crime should be forgotten on a computer's say-so. Julie is data, but not in the way she wants. It's quiet where she lives, in rural Kent, although she does have some noisy neighbours. We got them when they were about three months old and they were pretty big then, to be fair, but they have got a lot bigger. One day, working alone at home, Julie interrupted two men stealing her husband's tools. I came round here and uh, sort of said, what are you doing? As I said, it one jumped out the van holding tools and the other one stood here and I was standing there and held the crowbar up and basically told me to back off. This threatening behaviour is exactly the kind of crime that gets run through EBIT. When that fellow was holding the crowbar above my head, he laughed at me. He actually laughed and, you know, at the time that when it happened, obviously I was scared, but afterwards I was just so angry and I thought, well, how can, how can they do, just do that to people? It's our livelihood, it's, we're working and they, they just think they can take what they want. Before Kent Police began using its predictive algorithm, it pursued around 75% of cases. Now it investigates 40% with Julie's case among those dropped. The message that was left on my phone, um, they just basically said, you know, they've done their inquiries and they've nothing else they can do is and it's going on file. Although the force says it investigates all burglaries and that EBIT is 98% accurate. 
you can't go on a what the computer says, can you? It's got to be a um, human decision, basically. Yeah. Why is that? Because it's pers to me, it's personal. It's messed our, our lives up. It's you know, it's completely changed our life. I asked Jen about that 98% figure. She says it reflects the problems with all predictive algorithms. They're based on the faulty data of the past, so they only reaffirm our prejudices. The more that you see these systems, you realise there is huge amount of unfairness built into them from the beginning because their data are often inaccurate or incomplete. When are we going to stop and say, that's not right anymore? It's not fair, it's discriminatory. Lippy Lickshot is a former gang member and he feels disadvantaged by his data. There you go, you can drink your drink as well. Age 27, he's now a family man with three daughters and another one on the way. Millie, love. Look at Millie, don't look over there. But he can't escape his teenage track record. From the ages of about 14 to 20, I say, for the majority of the time, I'll get stopped at least once or twice a day. Lippy's in one of the biggest predictive algorithms in the UK, the Metropolitan Police's Gangs Matrix, which the Met used to track and target possible gang members. Lippy was one, but even though he's reformed, he can't move on with his life. I don't know how anyone else feels about strip searches, but for me it's traumatic. It's traumatic. They take you to a, a cell, they make three men come in and cross their arms and look at you, take your clothes off. And they say instructions, yeah, squat, lift up your scrotum, spread your cheeks, all of that. The gang's matrix used an algorithm to flag people as green, amber or red according to their perceived level of danger. I know I'm green. Well, I, was green. I, I don't even know I, if I was still on it. I've been told. I, I, you know I've been told. Who, I've been who by it? By a gang unit. Do you know what it was? Gang unit, yeah? The police, the police gang unit. Yeah. Lippy wishes he wasn't on the Matrix now, but at the time, he saw his ranking almost as a challenge. It's almost like they make you want to be a little bit harder than you are. It's like, right, I don't want to be green. I, I kind of want to be yellow or red kind of thing. It's a confusing thing to be a part of, like. That's what I'm saying, you should be told, you, you hear you on a database, you should be shitting yourself, you should be trying to, you should be trying to, trying to hide. But I remember feeling a, a sense of, oh, oh, so you know, so you know about me then, all right. The gang's matrix had even bigger problems. The Met put victims of gang crime on it and kept them there even if they posed no risk. Practices condemned by the UK's data watchdog. Although the Met told us it did not directly discriminate against any particular community. The youngest person on the gang's matrix was 12, and 88% of its subjects are black or ethnic minority. In many ways, computers are smarter than we are, so they may know what's best for us. But as we go about our lives, we assume we're making our own decisions, and we expect that we'll be treated in the same way as everyone else. With predictive algorithms, that won't always be the case. In the digital age, we are all data. But will we like the way we're being processed?